he said he was using mental stops. I would avoid mental stops until you were consistently following the plan. And trading is all about making decisions that are getting living with them. And because of the neurology involved with decisions, you want to let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. So let's say you're looking at a stock and you're thinking about getting in at, I don't know, just pull a number out here, 25, okay? Well, the stock's at 24 and it starts to rally a little bit. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to jump in now. I'm not going to wait for the entry, okay? And then if you got in at 25, your plan was to stop out, let's say at 20. Let's say it was a volatile stock, right? An IPO or something. Well, let's say you get in before 25 and then all of a sudden it starts going down. It's like, well, I'm not going to wait for it to go all the way to 20. I'm just going to get out. And before you know it, you could do that two or three times and end up chasing your own tail and really, really stress yourself out as opposed to waiting for that official entry and then putting a hard stop in after that. So let the market stop you into a position. As I've said many times, it's like I'll go to lunch or whatever. I have some resting orders in place and I'll get back from lunch. I'm like, oh, I have, I now have shares in my account because that decision was made for me. Now, if I was sitting there watching the trade, I might think, oh yeah, this thing doesn't look like it's gonna trigger. I'm gonna go have some lunch. Ah, I'm gonna come back and watch it later. Well, in that case, I might have missed that trade, okay? And that's going to cause a whole bunch of other problems to occur. So by letting the market stop you into position or stop you out of position. Now, I usually don't put a hard stop in unless it's getting fairly close or unless it dips below that stop level. And then I replace that stop after it does a little dip action to try to hold on and use a little discretion. But until you are consistently following the plan, until you trade a small size, until you trade one pattern and get good at it and slowly move up, then these slightly more advanced techniques like discretion, where you would allow that stop. Let's say you have an opening gap reversal and you have a good feeling it's going to bounce back. So instead of selling on that open while everybody's totally panic, you close, you close your eyes, you cross your fingers, you keep your eyes open, I guess. And if that stock immediately begins to reverse, you put in a stop right below that low and then let things let things let the chips fall where they may then. But the more the newer you are to trading, the more sort of mechanical you want to be, even though this is a discretionary type of system that I that I trade. Now, each decision, as I've talked about quite a bit, comes with stress, and that's neurology. Okay. If a decision didn't have a consequence or didn't have stress that it wouldn't be a decision. Every decision has a consequence. I, you know, my wife was very kind. She's going out with her friends tonight. So she was kind enough to buy me some fried chicken. So it's like, I, I, I was, you know, starving right before the show. It's like, if I had a mouth down on that, I didn't do that because I didn't want to be in here all lethargic and blah, 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 you know? <laughs> so that stupid little decision, as I've said before, can impact you quite a bit so every little decision comes with a lot of stress or a little stress and, and just think about next time you you go to make a decision on something a doctor's appointment or some other kind of appointment or whether or not you attend a party or not think about all the stress that comes with that think about all the consequences that come with that and as i've said before people who have been unfortunate and, and this uh, research comes from shoal and Damasio is a lot of the research uh, that I'm spouting out, off here. But according to Shaw and Damasio, people who have had injury or illness, the unfortunate injury or illness to their brains, and it's damaged that emotional part of their brain that helps them in their decision-making process, they cannot make any decision because one decision does have a consequence over the other. And I think that in life, I mean, for me, this was one of my epiphanies when I saw Denise Scholl talk, I think it was 13 years ago, I'm going back. I know it was 10 years between my speaking appearance and I'm trying to think it was the last time I spoke at uh, in San Francisco for the uh, uh, Technical Analysis Society, TSAA, and that's the San Francisco uh, chapter uh, over at Golden Gate. But anyway, uh, she made a really good point about how people that don't have that emotional part of their brain cannot make any decision because nothing has a consequence. So for your homework, what I'd recommend you do is as you 
make little decisions in life like oh do i stay up and watch the the finale on this series or do i stay up to three in the morning because somebody's speaking and they're speaking late or do i just go to bed and get a good night's sleep but oh, i really want to see what's going on but i also need to sleep because i have to work the next day so just start being cognizant of all your decisions and realize that in trading, it can be times 10 because it can be a, a bit of a pressure cooker, obviously. You can't kiss all the women. women. Uh, Bernie alluded to the fact that he was stressing out because stocks were taken off without him. Well, keep in mind that no methodology will guarantee that you capture all moves. So a lot of times I'll see stocks go up and up and up and up and up and never pull back. It's kind of like that TARS, which he eventually set up, and then I made a little of a trade, better than the poke in the eye, right? But that was something that I really wanted in, and it just kept going up. Now, if you're in a rip-roaring bull market, and we've had a few of these rip-roaring bull markets in the shit coins, SHYT, and all I did was buy the ones that are going up. That's a little bit different type of trading. 99% of what I normally do, though, involves a pullback, and no methodology will guarantee you, you capture all those moves. Now, true... You can buy new highs, and that will give you some sort of guarantee with the buy it B pattern IPOs. It doesn't all but guarantee you're in those setups, but it does help you to get into the setups that take off and keep on taking off. The IPOs that take off and keep on taking off with something like the buy it B, so that, that you are buying as that market's making new highs. In my Landry 200, last I checked, I had one that was up about 270%. I did not personally buy. Landry 100. I did not personally buy that stock, but I put it in the list when it was making new highs. My, uh, I should have, I should have put the formula in tonight. But basically, the formula is just a, a new 52-week closing high. And if I can't find a lot of those or enough of those, I go down a little bit further, maybe to a 90-day closing high, and that's it. With well, a few other caveats, I like the, the volatility to be there. I like the stock to trade fairly cleanly. I like it to be a stock that I'd want to trade anyway. Uh, with again enough volatility and such but uh, that's pretty much it and that's kind of a proof of concept i've ran this list before and i started running it again recently a couple of months ago I, I, I rebooted it and that's one of the things that's kind of fun i know you want to party with me but it's kind of fun to see these stocks go up and keep going up now keep in mind that in order for that kind of thing to work You either have to be in a fantastic market or have enough stocks to where you'll catch quite a few. Because as you know, breakouts tend to fail. So a lot of these stocks I put in, in this Landry 100 will fail within a few days. But enough other ones after a bit of a correction sometimes. And sometimes you just keep going straight back up. I had one up, like I think, like 50% the other day. Now, I wasn't personally long this stock, but at least it was in my momentum list. and. The only way you could actually kiss all the women, so to speak, or most of them, would be if you were running something like a momentum list, but that would require a tremendous amount of money to do to trade in such a fashion. Maybe in my next life, I'll run like the Landry 100 or something, and I'll just uh, 10 or 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day, whatever it takes, go and do the research or whatever. And then I'll be off to do whatever else, and I'll let all that just work its way out. But don't try to kiss all the women. And like I said, Buy a B does do a decent job in IPOs of catching an occasional hot IPO. But Buy a B in and of itself has a lot of caveats too. Price has to be a certain price. The range has to be a certain, a decent range at least. And there's a few other things. Now I would say. Just the opposite, you can't kiss all, kiss all the women. Only take highly specialized setups, okay? Something like a Landry Lake pullback, and that's it. And, and start with just one setup there, okay? And again, though, be willing to have a lot of stocks take off without you. Like the TARS or whatever, that thing went up for months, and I was not in it. And it finally set up, and I was able to get in it. Now, the other thing is let the market stop you out of a position, okay? So so once you're in, stick with it and ride the trend for a long time. So 
this guy was worried about his open profits drawdown again, okay? So he was finding himself getting out of the positions, but then how do you get back in? You have to wait for the next pullback. And like I just said, with the TARS, for instance, not to beat the dead horse on that, but if it just keeps on going up, you may not ever get a chance to get back in. And by the time you get a chance to get back in, it might be too late. I'm restudying Livermore. I did a series on Jesse Livermore, and a lot of it came from reminiscence of a stock operator. And I forget how many were in the series. I, I started the series thinking I'd do it, you know, four or five weeks or whatever. And it went on for like a year. Uh, and and the that's why I'm, I'm going to speak coming up in September on on Jesse Livermore. I'm going to kind of show how it dovetails in with what I do. And a lot of the things he says makes a lot of sense. Like he's he's known the market's going to retrace against him, and he knows he's going to lose a lot of money, but he also doesn't want to lose his positions. And one of the things I was reading recently is like some of the guys are like, why not just sell out and then buy it back on pullbacks? It's like, well, that sounds great, except that what happens if it just – goes up the day after you buy it. You're still waiting for that pullback and then it goes up and up and up and up. And before you know it, it's double or triple in price and you're still not in. Or worse, it begins to pull back. You think it's a bargain, you get in and that turns out to be the, the end of the road. So it's it's great to have, put yourself in a position where you have a system that you're following, a hybrid money management system, and you're going to stick with those longer term trends and then you're going to get out Maybe even at a loss, you know, shorter term. We have losses. We have plenty of losses, right? If I if I went a year without a loss, you'd never see my fast <laughs> again. It comes with the territory, right? But you do want to make fewer decisions because we all have a little bit different trading psychology based on our makeup. But I'd be willing to bet that we're more, more we have more in common on a psychological level than, than most are willing to believe. The point I'm making here is from a neurological level, we're all pretty much the same, okay? Unless you have an abnormal brain, right? So neurology works a certain way. You need emotions to make decisions. That's that You can't escape that. Now, you might be more emotional than others in your decision making, but no matter what, you can't eliminate your emotions. So neurology, again, is something that you might want to explore a little bit when it comes to trading. The thing to realize is markets aren't perfect, okay? And so are you and me. And this is what I was telling to this gentleman. Embrace, but don't try to eliminate your emotions, which I just beat the dead horse on. Accept the imperfect nature of yourself. The markets have a plan and let the chips fall where they may. Recognizing your problems is a huge step towards fixing them, channeling catering, catering, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. So if you think about trading with technical analysis, and I'm not talking about mumbo jumbo technical analysis, I'm talking about trend following moron stuff, right? Uptrends, pullbacks, pullbacks to the moving average, uh, trend knockout type of pattern, bow ties, all this fairly simple stuff I do. What I'm doing is I'm reading the emotions of the market participants in those two shorts. What happened? Stock went sideways for a while. Anybody who bought in that range and since the markets dropped below that range is now looking to get out at break even. I'm not counting of waves and Fibonacci and all this other stuff. I'm just looking at the charts and I only use for indicators the occasional moving average and something like both bow tie proper order in Landry light. And other than that, pretty much no indicators whatsoever. Now, the secret is reading the emotions of the market participants is fairly easy until, of course, you have a position on, right? Then you have a bias. So the hard part is embracing your own emotion. And you have to embrace again and not eliminate. Now, Yogi Berra once said if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And that's the reason technical analysis works, because the market participants often behave in an irrational manner. So you want to recognize and acknowledge that all decisions are emotionally based. If you could channel catering or catering, you know what you're doing wrong. You know what you're doing wrong.
And that's after you have a little bit of experience like this gentleman here. He basically told me everything he was doing wrong. And it's kind of like the doctor, doctor joke, which I think I have a slide in here. Don't do that. Live more again. You get so much good out of him. A stock speculator makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. And in Trading Full Circle, I talked about all these different things where people tell me what's going on. And I'll say, whenever I work with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm like, how the hell am I going to fix this guy or gal? And then I'm going to figure out what they're doing wrong. And it's like, I just ask them. I'm not honoring my stops. I'm taking profits too soon. Like this guy, uh, Bernie, he's taking profits too soon, right? And then he's looking to try to get back in. He's trying to be all things in all markets as opposed to just letting things unfold, okay? But anyway, I get tons and tons of confessions when I ask what people are doing wrong. And my favorite, of course, is when somebody emailed me and said, you know the passage from Paul, I know not to do, but I keep doing it. And I looked it up. Romans 7, 19, I want to do what is good, but I don't, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Amen. Kind of like the cat in the hat. There's a, there's a little, there's a little voice from my shoulder saying, don't do it. But there's a bigger voice saying, do it. Or something like that. Anyway, like the old doctor, doctor joke, it hurts when I do this. The solution is simple. Don't do that.